it's actually much more comfortable than you might imagine. <laughs> Let me tell you a strange story. A painful story. My family's story. It's a story that's full of shame and one that makes most people feel uncomfortable. Up until now, I've never wanted to talk about it. But today I do. Now you've heard of members of my extended family, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, great men, men of God. They lived good lives. Sure, they made a few mistakes, but their mistakes we talk about, they weren't that bad. But my immediate family, I need to talk about it because I need to find healing. It all began with Dad. Judah is, Judah is his name. He was Jacob's son. Dad went against God's directions by heading off to live with his friend Hiram and to try to find a wife on his own. And he did. He found a lady, he married her, they had a kid. They named him Ur. Ur is my older brother. I always wonder why Dad named him Ur. Maybe he thought, Ur, I should have done that. I don't know. Not long after that, Onan, my other older brother, was born. Onan. I wouldn't want that name either. But those names faded into significance when they named me Sheila. What a name. A boy named Sheila. Made a man out of me, though. Well, our family was pretty normal for a while. Er was the first one to get married. Dad told him, I'm going to handpick a beautiful girl for you. And he did just that. She was beautiful. Her name was Tamar. Owen used to tell him, with that woman and a fast camel, brother, you're bad. And he was right. Er was bad. In fact, he was just plain wicked, always in trouble. Tamar didn't help much. She was from the wrong side of the pasture, wild, free spirit. So they get married. They seem to be happy. And then suddenly, Er gets killed. Don't ask me how it happened. It's always been shrouded in mystery, but what is clear is that he died a violent death. And the story was going around, the story went around that God had killed him. Well, after that, our story gets a little more interesting, because that's when the Levite marriage law kicked into effect. You know the law that says that whenever a man dies without having any kids, his brother gets the widow pregnant and raises the firstborn son as his dead brother's firstborn. And this son not only gets his dead uncle's name, but also the family inheritance. Sounds a little strange, I know, but it was a sacred and well-respected custom. Well, that was Onan's job. But from day one, Onan was saying things like, No son of mine is going to be raised in Ur's name. If I have a son, he's going to be mine, named after me. And so Onan kind of took things into his own hands. Here's what happened. When he slept with Tamar, he didn't finish the job. For you medical types, coitus interruptus. For the rest of you, well, talk to the medical types. <laughs> and once again, we're back to God. Because apparently God wasn't too pleased with what Onan was doing, and so he killed Onan too. Here we have Tamar, married to Ur. The Lord kills Ur. Next we have Tamar and Odin, and Odin dies. The Lord killed him too. Now I'm next in line. You tell me, are you going to go rush in there and fulfill your duty and do the right thing? I went to Dad, and I said, Dad, I'm not too wild about this. And he said, hey, me either, but what can we do? If you don't follow through, we will be held liable before the family and the community, and even before God. I mean, we could really lose face in the family. Yeah, Dad, and I could literally lose face. The Lord doesn't seem very happy with us at the moment, and I'm certainly not anxious to provoke him to do anything else. So Dad thought for a bit, and he came up on a pretty good idea. He said, look, you're still in your teens. I'll send Tamar off to stay with her parents. I'll tell her Sheila's too young for you. 
When he gets a little older, you can come back and we'll have him raise the sun for her. But here's the thing. We just won't call her back. How about that? I said, that sounds like a pretty good idea, Dad. That'll get me completely out of this. And so that's what we did. Now, Tamar wasn't exactly excited about it. Because, as you know, a widow in our society isn't worth very much. But she didn't really have much of a choice. I'm sure she must have been hoping that it wouldn't be too long. Of course, we didn't tell her that neither Dad nor I had any plans whatsoever of bringing her back. Two dead sons in the family was enough. After Tamar left, we didn't hear much news about her except what filtered in through the camel caravans. And those tidbits made it real clear that as time passed and the older I got, the more upset she was becoming because Dad hadn't called her back. But in spite of that, life around our house was pretty normal. And then, unexpectedly, Mom died. That was a crushing blow for Dad. Three family members dead in a matter of a few years. It was terrible. Dad started going on sheep shearing trips more often after that. No real reason to stay home. We had a lot of sheep, so that kept him busy. Well, one day, I'll never forget this day as long as I live. It's ingrained in my memory. One day, a messenger from where Tamar was staying raced in and said, Judah, I've got to talk to you in private. Well, Dad was letting me in on most things by then, so he let me stay in the room. You could tell the messenger was really distressed about something. He cleared everybody out and breathlessly said, Judah, your daughter-in-law Tamar is pregnant. She apparently felt rejected by you since you haven't given her to Sheila. So she dressed up in front of the shrine as a prostitute, sold herself to some traveling merchant, and got herself pregnant. Whew. You should have seen the veins in Dad's neck bulging out. His face got red. He began to shake. Now, you've got to understand, our family's reputation is very important to Dad. He's always talked to us about being, quote, children of the promise, whatever that means. He says you've got to be better than the people around you, all of you. Even, if you like this phrase, even the stranger within our gates. And for him, that apparently included Tamar. Dad was so livid about how he would look once this got out. He leapt up, he began to pace and shout, can you imagine what this is going to look like? What in the world are people going to think about us? How could she do something like this to me, to our family? This is going to shame us all. I thought he'd never stop, but finally he calmed down a bit and got real stoic. Then he finally muttered through clenched teeth, she'll pay for this. I'll make sure of that. Then he paused for several minutes more and everything got quiet, tense, dead silence. And then he said, bring her here. Bring her here. We're going to punish her. We're going to burn her. That's what we'll do. We'll show the heathens around us that we do not put up with such things. And that will take care of the shame. That will restore our family pride. It'll probably even justify us in God's eyes. So we'll burn her. That's what we're going to do. It's hard to describe what I felt right then. I was terrified for Tamar. I mean, I liked her. Didn't want to marry her, but I liked her. But on the other hand, what she had done clearly reflected a bad image on us. And I didn't like that either. They probably deserved to be punished. But that was kind of scary because I'd done things that I certainly wasn't proud of. And what if Dad found out about those? What would he do to me? And maybe I should admit it, I even felt a bit relieved. I wouldn't have to try to have a son for her now. I wouldn't have to chance something going wrong and end up paying for it with my life. I felt so many different things. Well, Dad got some of our men together, sent them off and told them, get Tamar and bring her back. They were gone several days, and the whole time they were gone, Dad stayed mad. And I could see why. There may have been a few exceptions, but Dad had lived an honest, clean life. And then to have somebody ruin his family's reputation like that, well, it was just really, really sad. And then they got back with Tamar. I'll never forget it. 
The caravan pulled in, Tamar in tow. Dad was ready to carry out this little ceremony as quickly as possible. He was ready to purge the earth of this shame. To let people know that our family will not put up with this. It simply will not be tolerated. So it was all set up by the time she got there. There were a lot of people there. It wasn't every day you saw a pregnant woman burned alive, so everybody came out. And I think Dad was feeling pretty good about it. Now a lot of people would see the punishment he was ready to dole out. Our family reputation would be restored. I think people come out because of some kind of morbid curiosity. You know, when there's that big donkey crash down in the corner, people want to see what's happening. The scene was engraved, is engraved in my memory. It took place in the middle of a compound where we lived. Tents and pastures surrounded an open yard in the middle. And in that yard, a big, large wooden altar was built. It was elaborate. Everything from dry kindling to big logs was in place. There was just one thing missing. Tamar. I knew this was going to be ugly. Certainly she'll go kicking and screaming. Everybody gathered around, some seated, some standing, and then the moment came to bring her out. And a silence fell over the place. Looking back on it now, it seems so clear, but that day I couldn't figure out why Tamar seemed so calm. It certainly wasn't what you pictured, someone acting like when they're about to be burned to death. You'd think she'd be yelling and pleading and screaming, but she wasn't doing any of that. She just walked right along, pretty as you please, between her guards. She almost had a smirk on her face. No crying, no begging. In fact, the, the best word I can think of to describe how she looked was smug. I remember that it suddenly hit me, oh no, she doesn't think that Dad's serious about this. She doesn't think he's going to do it. Well, they brought her out, right there in front of everybody, and Dad stood up to stop the accusation. Tamar, you're being burned today because you shamed our family by becoming a shrine prostitute. You sold yourself, your body, and our family name to some degenerate stranger who got you pregnant. But our family and our beliefs will not allow this to go unpunished. So today you die. And then Tamar was allowed a few final words. She stood straight, head held high, belly protruding, proud, didn't look scared at all. She stood there and she proceeded to destroy our family. Okay, she said. I'm willing to suffer the penalty for my actions. I did what you said. I admit that. But I have a few words for you before it happens. First of all, let me say to you, Father Judah, and she said Judah with a hint of a sneer on her lips, you know, Father Judah, what's supposed to happen when a widow has no children. And yet you've been deliberately withholding Sheila from me. She looked right at me. It was a look mixed with anger and sympathy. So I finally decided to take things into my own hands. Yes, I admit that. But before I die, I want people to know. And she turned and motioned with her fettered hands. I want people to know something. She motioned to someone who had accompanied her and spoke. Would you show everyone the staff, the cord, and the seal of the man who is the father of my child? He knelt down and picked up the items. Then slowly and ceremoniously he held up the staff, the cord, and the seal for everyone to see. Now it took a second for it to sink in, and the only one it really registered with at first was Dad. I was standing right there and I saw Dad suddenly stiffen. His back went rigid, his face lost color. He went white, absolutely white. And then I realized why. That was Dad's staff, and Dad's cord, and Dad's seal. Dad's! I felt like I'd been kicked in the stomach. Surely there must be some kind of mistake. Not you, Dad. I looked at him. Please, Dad, please don't let it be true. But in looking at him, I could see that there had been no mistake. I've never seen my father look so devastated, so ashamed. What could be said at a moment like that? There just aren't words. But Dad finally came up with something, and it's something that I'll never forget. He sat there for a moment, white as a sheet, not blinking, not breathing, not moving. 
And finally, in a voice cracking with emotion and filled with shame, he said, she is more righteous than I. She is more righteous than I. Yes, Dad, I guess she is. She took things into her own hands, but she was just trying to fulfill the law and the promise that he had made to her. Well, that pretty much ended the fireworks for the day. Tamar was released and people <laughs> filtered away in silent little clusters. Except for me, I had to know more. I found Hira, Dad's friend, and I said, Hira, what in the world is going on? Well, he stammered, your dad and a few of us were on a sheep shearing expedition. And somehow, don't ask me how, Tamar found out about it. I guess she was feeling rejected and angry, so she came up with this devious plan. She took off her widow's clothes, covered her face, and dressed up like a shrine prostitute. She then went out and waited by the roadside until we came by. And your dad propositioned her, obviously having no idea who she was, as though that fact would have excused the whole matter. Judah, my father, my righteous father, had done all this? Well, obviously, Hira said, Tamar took him up on it, asked him what he'd pay, offered her, he offered her a kid goat, which he didn't have on him at the time, and so she wasn't buying that, and so she said, give me your seal, your cord, and your staff, as a pledge that you'll pay. Well, Hira said later, when we sent the goat to her, and tried to retrieve your dad's stuff, she was gone. We asked around, we asked the people, where is the shrine prostitute who was sitting here? And they said, there, there, there is none. There never has been one. So dad said, let's get out of here before we become a laughing stock. Looking back at it now, it's obvious why Tamar looked so smug and relaxed that day. She was released, dad recovered some composure. And he told her it would be fine to live with us and raise the child in her name. She stayed, and a few months later, twins were born, Perez and Zara, and they've been brought up in her name. And life, well, life's been as normal as possible. But you know, Dad's never been quite the same. The fire, the fierceness, the pride is gone. I'll never forget the day that my family pride died. And I've thought about that day a lot. I've lived with that day ever since it happened. So many times people have asked me difficult questions about my family's story. Questions like, did God really kill your two brothers? I don't know. It doesn't fit my picture of God. It seems like people are always blaming things on him that he may or may not have done. If it floods, God did it. There's a drought, God did it. Someone dies, God did it. God seems to get the blame for a lot of things. And I'm not at all convinced that he deserves it all. So I don't know if he killed my brothers. I'll let you decide. But even harder to answer is when people sneer and ask me questions like, how can you all say that you are God's people? The apple of his eye. And you continue to believe and insist that a, a, what you call it, a, a Messiah is coming. And that he's going to come through your family line? Come on. The God you're supposed to serve doesn't allow the shameful things your family has done, does he? He allows that to go on? Are your God's people supposed to act that way? Well, all I can tell you is what I think. It's not the last answer. But I've thought about it a lot. And the first thing I would say is that sadly, tragically, I guess God's people do act that way sometimes. I guess we sometimes do have problems just like everyone else. It's hard to admit, and it's sad to say, but I think it's true. But at the same time, it also seems true that even though we have problems just like other people, God seems to be an expert at bringing good out of bad. Amen. Our family has a long history of taking things into their own hands and ending up in horrible messes. My great-grandfather Abraham took things into his own hands when he thought God had run out of time for his son. And you know what a mess the Ishmael situation turned out to be. Grandpa Jacob took things into his own hands when he thought Esau was going to get the birthright. And that family fight lasted for years. Dad and his brothers took things into their own hands when they thought Joseph was being treated too well. And that just about killed Grandpa Jacob. 
And now Tamar took things into her own hands when she thought she was being forgotten. All along, we keep taking things in our own, into our own hands. And every time we do, we mess it up. You think we've learned. But what's so amazing to me is that every time somebody takes things into their own hands and messes it up, God seems able to bring good out of bad. And I just don't understand how he's able to do that. I mean like Abraham in his old age, not believing God could come through. But after the Ishmael fiasco, God came through and Isaac was born. Or Jacob and Esau, the family fight that will never heal, they used to say. But years later, God healed it. And Uncle Joseph, apparently dead and gone, saved our whole family from famine. It seems like God has brought good out of so much tragedy. But all those stories are known. They're talked about. They're acceptable. With my immediate family, it's different. Ours isn't an acceptable mistake. It's filled with too much shame. It's so much easier just to keep it secret. I'm not sure even Abraham's God can forgive and fix this one. And you know, even if our family story were to be told from generation to generation, from Abraham on down, I'm sure my own family story would be left out. Because I just don't think God can bring anything good out of it. I don't think there's any hope. Judah and Tamar, my father and my sister-in-law, if they're ever remembered, will probably be remembered as family outcasts. The two who don't belong. And that makes me very, very sad. Well, that's it. Our shameful story. Our family tragedy. <laughs> the gospel, according to Matthew, chapter one. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Judah and Tamar, ancestors of Jesus Christ. Amen. Where sin abounded, grace did much more. Amen. 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 Amen.